Hello, welcome back to my channel. Today's video is about petition, a fiancé visa, and I'm going to introduce to you my husband who can help you about it because um, he helped a lot of people to um, get their fiancé from Philippines. Okay, here's my husband. Um, his name is Rich and I'm Tata. And yes, I am um, from Philippines and he petitioned me as um, his fiance. Okay, I'll let him explain it to you. Uh, just to start, I want to make it clear. I am not a lawyer. Uh, I have no formal training in uh, filing uh, the paperwork for uh, immigration, but I did complete the paperwork successfully uh, to bring my wife to the United States. And I have helped uh, quite a number of people manage the paperwork. So al although I'm not a professional at it, I am somewhat proficient and I know some of the tricks that, uh, or not really tricks, some of the traps people can fall into if they're not paying close attention. Mm -hmm. The form that you will be using uh, for the United States citizen is the U.S. CIS form I-129F, and that's an application for petition of fiancé. Uh, that, that form is also used if the fiancé has children that will be petitioned along with her. There is another form very similar uh, the I-130, which is if you're already married to your spouse or another, or trying to bring a relative, uh, but I'm not really going to be talking about that, but it's a, a very similar process. Okay. Um, when you do this, you're going to want to try to have all of your information ready. Uh, you're going to want to have your birth certificate yeah, yeah. Uh, if you have it available you want to have your parents birth certificates and marriage certificate yeah. if you have ever been divorced you need to have declarations of divorce and your divorce certificate if you're involving children you need their birth certificates also yeah. and you want to have all of that information uh, if you don't have it. I know in the Philippines you can get most of those documents at any NFO office, but it, depending upon the age of your parents, if they did not have uh, those documents filed, you're okay, but it's it's more difficult. They will want to know where your parents were born, yep. if they're still alive, where they are living now, if they have passed uh, the age that they passed. Okay. okay, so I'm going to start uh, basically at the top of the form. Uh, you have to be a U.S. citizen to file this. You can be a naturalized citizen, but you have to be a citizen. Now, if you're a naturalized citizen, you will have been given an A number when you filed to come into the United States. And after you uh, the process started, you were assigned an A number. So you will put that in there and that's actually line number one and this first section is all the US citizens information so you will put in your A number uh, if you've got a USCIS account number you will enter that your social security number and then you'll check whether or not you're going to do the fiance visa which is the K1 visa or the K-3 visa, which is the spouse visa. But like I say, I'm just going to go through the fiancé portion of it because I really haven't done much with the spouse, though it's pretty much the same. Um, and it, then you will put your full name, uh, first, middle, last. You'll put any other names that you've ever used. Uh, if if you had a different name 
in marriage or for any reason changed a name, yeah. you need to have all the names that you have gone by on this form. Mm -hmm. You will also need uh, to put your full address. If you don't have your own address and you're sending it in care of somebody, uh, then you need to put their name on the form that you are sending a form in care of this person. You want to have complete address and I just want to really clarify when you fill these forms out and you send them in, you want to review everything before you send it because if there's a problem, it's really going to delay the process and you have to pay a, a pretty fair fee for it. I'll, I'll get into the fees later. And when you do file it, the fee that I'm giving is the fee based on today, which is August 6, 2020. Uh, the fees do change over time. So you need to go to the USCIS.gov website and that will give you all of the current fees. Yep. So we, we now have where you've got your full name and mailing address information in there. You are now going to need to do an address history for the last five years. So if you've lived at the same address for more than five years, you don't have to do anything more for this section. But if you've moved in less than five years, you need to list that address. If you've moved four times in the last five years, you need to list all, all of those addresses because you have to have a minimum of five years worth of addresses for them to track. Um, that's for running background checks and making sure you are who you say you are and that you have the legal right to be filing this form. The next portion that you will need to fill out is your employment information. Uh, if you're self-employed, you can state that, but for your employer, you need to have the full address, full phone number, you need to list what your occupation is. And as with your address, you need to have at least a five year employment history. So if you've got, if it takes more than one job to give you your five year employment history, then you need to list multiple jobs so you can show uh, at least that period of time. Okay. Now, it, now it gets to the, the portion about the person that you're going to bring in. On the form, they actually call that person the beneficiary. So, oh. so when, when you go get to that, uh, it'll say information about beneficiary. Now, if they've already got a permit to enter the country, uh, the day that their authorization on the I-94 or not I-95 expires needs to be entered into that. But if you don't have that information, that is a portion that can be filled in at a later point. Uh, they should apply for a passport so they at least have a basic passport because you can't get a visa unless you've got a passport. So yeah. you, it, it does no good to apply for a visa if you don't have your Philippines passport to begin with. And the, with the passport, it will have a passport number. It'll have the country that issued the passport and it'll have the expiration date of the passport. It, this is the point where it asks whether or not the beneficiary has any children. So if you do have children, then you fill out that information on the next spot. And there is slots there. If you run out of space, then there is additional room uh, in, in part eight of this form that has blank areas. 
and you can actually print as many copies of that blank page as needed to fill out any inf extra information that you don't have room for in the slots. That goes for addresses if you have a whole lot of them or a lot of jobs. Uh, you want to be thorough because you don't want them to go through this and say, hey, they didn't tell me something. And then you put up a red flag and now you're fighting the red flag because they're saying, well, if they didn't tell me this, what else aren't they telling me? So you yeah. want to be thorough and get everything taken care of. So you list the beneficiary, the person that you're trying to bring to the country as the fiance, mm -hmm. and you need to list their children. Uh, if they have an address in the United States, which I guess is theoretically possible, uh, you would list that. But if they haven't been to the United States and this is a process that you're working on, then there would not be a United States address, just your address in the Philippines. Now it does have your, your, the beneficiaries physical address abroad. That's where you put your address in the Philippines. Uh, and it, it also asks uh, if you need a different alphabet for your name. Uh, like if you were uh, in Saudi Arabia or China and they have different symbols. I, I know that uh, Philippines uses the same alphabet that uh, at, that the, we do in the United States, so the actual... Mostly. Mostly, mostly. Enough so that you can get through this form anyhow. But if you do need special adaptation for Alphabet, then they've got a form where you can do that and say that you need that type of information. Mm -hmm. uh, now it asks for what your employment is in the Philippines for the beneficiary if the, if they are employed. If they're not employed, you don't have to put anything in there, but it's going to ask for an appointment. That's, that's the fiance. Yes, so. the fiance in the Philippines. This is, we're, we're, we're talking about the person in the Philippines. Uh, you will put in just uh, when your employment started and when it stopped. Uh, then it goes into personal information, uh, your gender, uh, date of birth, whether or not uh, you're uh, single, divorced, uh, widowed. Uh, they're going to want to know where you were born, the city, town, the province, and the country. And then it gets into that where I said earlier, you need all that information for your parents. You need the full name, you need their date of birth and location of birth, uh, and you will fill all of that information out and you want to be as thorough as you possibly can uh, with those documents so there's, there's no reason that they could reject your form. Um, once you go through that there is a question have you ever been previously married and if you have then you need to have the complete information for your previous spouse uh, their name you need the date that the marriage ended they're going to ask your current citizenship status uh, and if you're not a US citizen then you wouldn't click you wouldn't check anything because you weren't born in the U.S., you weren't naturalized, uh, you don't have U.S. citizens for parents, mm -hmm. uh, and you would not have obtained a naturalization certificate. So that part you don't have to worry about because if you had the U.S. citizenship, you, you wouldn't be filling out the visa yeah, form yeah, anyhow. It's right. kind of a waste, waste in time and effort and money to fill out a, a, a form to get into the United States if you're already a United States citizen. Yeah. So uh, then it's going to ask, this is for uh, the U.S. citizen. Actually, I, I, I'm, I was wrong there. Uh, 
The U.S. citizenship information is for the American filing the petition. They will say whether or not they are natural born citizen, uh, a citizen by virtue of their parents or by naturalization. Uh, that's for the, the person filing this in the United States. Uh, the next thing that they're going to want to know is whether or not you've ever filed a I 129F before. Have you previously married somebody from another country and used this process to bring them to the country? And if so, you will put in all of that information. And if you've got all that information in, uh, say for some reason uh, you, you married a Filipina and uh, by but for whatever reason, the marriage didn't work out, um, but they had been here long enough that they, they've established residency, but either maybe you got divorced, maybe had an accident or sickness or, or whatever, you know, you, the, the man is no longer married to a Filipina or a woman no longer married to the Filipino man. But you need to have that information if you've previously filed an I-129F. And uh, I would guess if you filed five or six of these, they might start wondering, are you just marrying people to get them to the United States? And uh, once they're here, then you go marry somebody else to bring them to the United States, which would be considered fraud and uh, it could get you thrown in prison for 10 years. So not a good thing. So you will, you'll continue to fill out any information uh, about the previous I-129F filings. Uh, you will now fill out any information on children that you have and the U.S. citizen that's filling this form out will put residency in the United States or in other countries if the U.S. citizen has lived abroad. Say I, I filed this petition when I was living in Australia, I can still file the petition for uh, my fiance to get a U.S. visa even if I'm living in Australia, but I have to show where I'm currently living and where I have lived. Okay, yeah. Now, it now, be in, in the US well, it, it, at some point, because this visa only gives you 90 days to get married once you arrive in the country. And the people that I have helped, I tell them, if you want to have a nice big wedding in the United States, that's great, but those take a little bit of time to plan. Yeah. So what you should do is as soon as they get here, go down to the courthouse, get yourself a marriage certificate, and uh, have your local pastor or a judge perform the ceremony so you can file your change of status form. Right away. Because if you go beyond the 90 days, they will not extend the, the K-1 visa and you will have to go back to the Philippines and you'll have to start the process all over. So you want, you want to have the legal marriage done as soon as possible so you don't have any problems. And there's also other side benefits. Uh, the person sponsoring the fiance, if they are working full time and have a job, the sooner they're married, the sooner their spouse will be able to be on their health insurance yeah. and things like that. So you want to have those things because... Especially when the, when the fiancé is pregnant, something like yeah, that. Yeah, if, if, if the fiancé <laughs> is pregnant, you definitely want to have health insurance yeah, right, uh, away. right away. So there's no question about your coverage because uh, doctor's bills can be really expensive without yeah. insurance. Yeah. Um, now it goes back to information about the beneficiary again, and it will 
ask all the the family name, uh, A number, social security number, which again, if you don't have that information, if they don't have a social security number yet, you can't do that. Uh, it's going to ask again uh, where you were born. Uh, it's going to ask other names that you've used. So all of that information uh, will, will be entered. Uh, you go to the next and it, it starts uh, listing addresses again. It's got a, in, if you have somebody else receive your mail, it's going to have an in care of name. Otherwise, you just put that name. You're going to have a, a five year address history. Again, like the U.S. citizen, you're, you need to have an address history. In Philippines. In, in Philippines or Saudi Arabia or Dubai, wherever you, wherever you're coming from, you need to have a five-year address history. Okay. So you will also go in and have to do a five-year employment history for the person coming to the Philippines. How about if they don't have a job? If you don't have a job, then you have no employment history where it says name of employer. Just put not applicable. Uh, and okay. you don't have to do it. But if you've had an employer in the last five years, then list that. Uh, it it would actually, on the very first one, in part uh, part eight is what's here, and that's giving those extra slots that I told you about for uh, addresses and employers. This is giving you the the slots that if you need to have extra information that you haven't previously entered, you put that information there about uh, your your information, your children's information, your parents' information, anything that you didn't have room for before, you can start listing here. And they have lots of different Which, slots. What page is that? Uh, it starts on, uh, let's see, page five of the 13 pages of this form, they have uh, where you have that information. By the way, guys, we have to um, put the link down below the description. So um, just check it over there and then you can click it and then you can download the, the information or that kind of stuff. Yes, the we will have a link for the PDF, which is actually a fillable form that you can fill it all out on the computer and print it. And the only thing that you've got to actually do is sign the bottom of it. Um, if you do use a marriage broker, which like I said, I did the paperwork all myself and I've helped other people. And I don't see why anybody should spend all that money on a marriage yeah. broker to fill out the paperwork that really isn't that hard to do. No, it's not. So, but if you know. did if you so. did use a marriage broker, you would need to put that type of information in there. Um, if uh, the U.S. citizen is abroad, like my example of being uh, in Australia, uh, I could apply this visa at the United States Embassy Embassy in Sydney, Australia. Uh, to oh. file because I'm abroad. Wherever they are, they can yeah, apply. You, you can apply at the United States Embassy okay. in the country, but it's where the U.S. citizen is. Uh, okay. I wouldn't have applied, made the application to the embassy in Manila because I was living in the United States yes. at the time. Yes. So it wouldn't have been appropriate for me to file in Manila and it would have actually slowed down the process. Yeah. Next part, very critical, and if you have ever had any type of criminal history other than like a basic speeding or parking ticket, you need to list it. It's not going to be something that will necessarily keep you out of the country, but you have to list it because you're listing that five years of work history and address history. And they are going to check your background. Yeah. And if you had some type of criminal past, maybe something relatively minor, 
but you don't list it, that's going to exclude you and it will it, it will permanently exclude you if you intentionally left off a criminal background. Um, most people, if they uh, murdered somebody or committed armed robbery, they're probably not going to be the person that you're going to want to uh, marry and bring to the States anyhow, and they'd probably be in prison. So it, it really wouldn't uh, be an issue. But uh, if if there was a, a minor thing like, uh, uh, well, it's not minor, it is serious, but it, I don't believe it would prohibit. If you had a single incidence where you were convicted of drunk driving, uh, you went through, you met all your obligations, uh, that would not necessarily cause you to not be able to come no, to the United still, States. We have to list it. But you have to list it. The because if, you, if you're if you not honest and you say, oh, they'll never find out. I was only 16 years old when it happened, when it happened so I was a minor, so that shouldn't yeah. count against me. Well, you want to list it because Amen. if you don't list it, then it's and they find it, it's going to come back and bite you, and you're not going to be able to come because, again, if you if you lie on one part of it, then how do they know you're not lying on other parts? So you got to be really careful. It will ask also specifically if you've ever been arrested or convicted of any type of domestic violence, sexual assault, sex abuse, child neglect, dating violence, elder abuse, striking, or an attempt to commit any of those crimes. Um, I, I got to tell you, if, if you're a, uh, abusing children or elderly, you probably don't even need to bother filling this form out because if, have uh, if, if you if if you have a, a history where you have done severe injury to uh, a spouse uh, significant other a, a child a parent um, you might be able to overcome that but it's going to take quite a bit of convincing and they're going to want to know that the things that you have done to change your life so you're no longer going to be abusive to other people. Yeah. So that is something that you need to be aware of. Okay. I I personally don't, I haven't dealt with anybody that had an abusive past like that, but it is something that can happen. Now, while I am talking about that, uh, when you do get ready to come to uh, the States, that if all of this paperwork goes through and you get your consulate interview and everything and they get ready to, vis to issue your fiancé visa, they will make the, the Filipinas go to a class that tells you about spousal abuse because as, as much as you'd like to think everybody is a good person. There have been some people that bring a fiance to the United States and they, they abuse them. They severely abuse them. So they're going to tell you what resources are available if once you get to the United States, the person that you thought was going to be the love of your life starts abusing you or your children. And they tell you, contacts on who to contact what to do so you get out of the situation where people are hurting you mm -hmm. um, and don't stay in that relationship where you're being hurt just because you say well I don't want to go back to the Philippines I was so poor there and I was hungry and leastwise I have food here if they're abusing you and you go to the proper authorities and you show this they're not gonna send you back there they're gonna try to do whatever they can to help you stay here and, and help you get get on your own two feet so you can go on with your life. 
but don't stay in an abusive relationship just because you're afraid of getting sent back. Um, go, yeah. Going going on, uh, it, it asked uh, about uh, uh, whether or not you've uh, done a number of different crimes and it ha goes through all these different things. Uh, it, it will ask you about uh, if you've made multiple, if you've had uh, restrain, restraining or, orders issued against the person filing this or the beneficiary, you want to make sure that you list whether or not there's been restraining orders issued. They then have a form where it asks your nationality and uh, biological information. It's going to ask you uh, whether or not you're Hispanic, not Hispanic, white, Asian, black. It's going to ask how tall you are, how much you weigh, eye color, hair color, all that type of information for the basic biographic information. Then it gets to the petitioner, the U.S. citizen statement and certification and they will mark that they've read everything, that they filled this out to the best of their ability. And if, again, if there was a preparer, they will list who prepared the form. And then you will sign and date it. There is a section, if you had an interpreter, to help you fill out the form that the interpreter puts their information in and the interpreter will sign that they interpreted this form and they certify under perjury, threat of perjury, that they filled out the form properly. Uh, they would put in contact information for whoever prepared the form and their address and a, a preparer's statement along with a preparer's signature. Uh, then page 13 of the 13 is again additional space for uh, uh, jobs listed and uh, residences listed. Uh, I told you before that uh, I'd get to the fees. Um, when you file this form, you have to send in a fee. Hold on, let me scroll to it real quick. The current fee is $535, which must be filed at the time this petition is filed, and it's a non-refundable fee. So you want to make sure that your form is right, because you don't want to submit something and have it not be right, and you've already paid a $535 fee. That, that, that would make me rather sad if I paid that fee and I found out that I didn't have everything that I needed in that. Now, I'm also going to include a link in addition to the one for the actual form for instructions on how to fill out the form. Uh, to be eligible, you need to have seen each other face to face yeah, within the last two years uh, prior to filing. So if it's been a year and 11 months, you need to start right now, I mean right now, getting that form. Otherwise, they're going to have to travel back to the Philippines. Now, you want to, while in the Philippines, take a number of pictures yes. with, with each other. Uh, at, you want to save receipts for motels, restaurants. Uh, all the things that document, uh, you're going to want, the, the American is going to need to save their uh, ticket receipts for airfare showing that yeah. they flew, mm -hmm. flew to the Philippines. But all of that at that time, time they actually wanted physical letters written between the couple that actually got mailed with postage. 
You can do that or not do that if you want to. Uh, if I know a lot of uh, men send no. packages to the Philippines. So if you, if you basically mail or send a bullock buy-in box to mm -hmm. the Philippines and it's got that and it, you've got your address and their address, it's showing that, but you do want to save correspondence, emails, and that type of stuff, or, so you can. Or, uh, talk, talking on messenger. Yes, uh, things. Yeah, you can messengers, print that out. Uh, things that you can print out chats and mm -hmm. things like that, uh, and you want want to ha go to places in the Philippines that you can have as easily identifiable as being in the Philippines. And all of these things are going to help you with the process. Now, that, that, this pretty much covers all of the I-129F. I'll be doing another video that talks about how to file the change of status once you have got into the United States. And yeah. they've got some different variables involved in that. And they might have you do uh, fingerprints and stuff like that in the United States, but currently they, they'll probably do that in the Philippines. But that's about all I've got for right now. Hopefully so, this has been helpful. Um, how about the payment in Philippines? Or the interview, we have to pay something like that. Okay. Well, all, all the fees have to be paid prior to you getting an embassy visit. Uh, they do have some medical fees and things that have to be done in when it, in the Philippines. So you will need to have some money there. And but it's not much. It, it's, it's not a whole lot, but it is something that uh, I, I'd probably have five to 10,000 pesos. Probably wouldn't spend anywhere near that much, but I think it's more Dep than $100 now. Oh, it is? Well, like I said, it's been 17 years since I've been there. So uh, you'd be able to find out just how much you needed, but it's it's not a huge amount, no, all not. things considered. Uh, but you want to make sure that you've got everything. Um, if you've ever had TB, they're going to do a lot of tests and make sure that you don't yeah. currently have TB because they don't want somebody with an active virus coming into the United States. So they would they would uh, give you some medicine that would help would, and basically ensure that you don't have TB anymore. Yeah. Okay guys, thank you for watching this video. I hope um, it can help other people there that needs, um, you know, that needs help because this is really important if if um you don't have help some people um um hire for uh hire a lawyer for this but you know that's why we post this video because this is just really easy to do and if my husband if my husband can do it i think you can do it so we'll see you again next time bye 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 have a great day